Okay, it looks like everybody is here and still joining. Can everybody hear me? Those of you who I can see, can you give me a thumbs up? All right, beautiful, beautiful. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just so you are in the right place. We're gonna make sure that you are in the OWCN Town Hall. That's where we are today and it is May 7th. And again, thank you all for being here today. We have a great lineup of speakers um, for the next hour that we're gonna spend together and we will absolutely get some time to entertain questions that you have and we'll go over how we would like you to submit them in just a second. So again, we're at the OWCN Town Hall. We thank everybody from our network for joining us today. Um, we are going to focus a little bit on COVID-19, some recent activities within our network, and then also some operational updates. Few housekeeping items that we wanted to go through about Zoom. If everybody could please mute their, um, down in the right corner, you should see a mute, unmute. You can also mute by doing shift command A if you're on a Mac. We would love for you to have your video on today. However, if your bandwidth doesn't allow you or if you just don't want us to see your wonderful face, that is perfectly fine. You can start and stop video down here um, on the left corner where it says stop video. If you click the arrow, it will also give you an option to start video. Moving on to a little more Zoom, um, later in the day or in the session, we will have an opportunity to do a Q&A session. Scott Buell is gonna lead that for us. So we would love for you to use the chat function to um, submit your questions. So you will see the chat button, um, which is usually down in the center where it says chat, or it's gonna be up on the top, depending on how you have your uh, Zoom set up. And then what will happen is you will see um, a box that pops up and says to everyone, please submit your questions to everybody. We would love for everybody to be able to see the questions that are submitted today. And also um, you'll know if your question has already been asked or something similar. So type your message where it says type message here and then click enter and then your message will um, come up in the chat. And I see a few chats are already popping up. So it sounds like you guys are already um, doing this, which is great. And any questions that we, we don't get to today, we will do our best to try and look through the questions and get to as many as possible. We will um, come up with a way to address them and make sure that everybody's questions are answered. And finally, if you need to end the meeting today, if you need to leave for whatever reason, um, all you need to do is click the button here that says end meeting, and then you will just come out of the meeting. We have one hour planned for you today. So um, with that, I'm just gonna introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Jana Mazet from the One Health Institute. She is our executive director and she is gonna give a COVID-19 update. So go ahead and let's get started. Thanks for having me. If you could release that screen, then I'll share you my- got it. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Okay, you guys see that? All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here um, as a proud board member of the OWCN and the director of the One Health Institute. And we wanna to bring to you today a little different twist on COVID updates because there's so much going on. We're all struggling um, with our own um, issues with COVID. You could have lost loved ones. You might be really under difficult circumstances in sheltering, um, but there is hope. So I'm, I'm back to a World War II blueprint um, but I think it can take us um, from this tragedy and into a place because we can help and we all are all in this together and we can do this and get out of it. 
Um, right now, uh, I think we all know we're, we're over a million cases in the U.S. Um, about a third of the cases worldwide are in the U.S. But in California, um, we have uh, almost 60,000 cases. Uh, and I think there's hope right there that people of California really went into sheltering early and did a great job helping to flatten the curve and give our um, California health systems um, really a chance to be ready. We are a full 10% lower number of cases per 100,000 people than New York City. And that is a testament to all of you and what we all have been doing to try and control this. We know that there are testing issues and we're gonna see those numbers continue to rise. Um, but thankfully, the number of deaths per day in California look to be flattening or even possibly um, going on the decrease. So we hope to keep that trend while we will likely see the case numbers continue to increase as we do better testing. All right, so what can we do? What can we do about COVID-19? What is the current situation and how can we stop the next disease X? And I think for all of us um, on this uh, this webinar, we really want to focus on um, the animals, protecting the animals, as well as protecting ourselves. And the bottom line is we don't really know where this um, virus started and how it started, but it is almost certain that the evolutionary host was a bat. Now, did the bat um, that, that evolved with this virus have an opportunity to connect and expose people directly or did it spill over into an intermediate host, possibly in the um, value chain for human use of wildlife, like for food in markets or, um, or in the wildlife trafficking situation. We know that pangolins also have a coronavirus that have the equipment that can, can enter into human cells. We just don't know that yet, and it's going to be some time before we do. We do know that only a handful of coronaviruses were known to um, exist and infect human um, that could infect humans. Um, this SARS coronavirus 2 making the seventh in that list. Um, but coronaviruses, the family, the taxonomic family, has been a very important veterinary pathogen um, recognized for ages. Um, so we, we know this is an impactful viral family and obviously um, a lot of our team had been raising the flag about getting ready for disease X that could be a coronavirus for some time um, and um, may, maybe more than a decade. Uh, and um, now, unfortunately, because of this tragedy, we all know that it's possible uh, and we need to use this as our call to action to really move in the right direction to be prepared for um, all of these viruses. I think it's important and you all can be great um, advocates for the wildlife in this circumstance. Really, um, we need to remind people why bats are important in our ecosystems and why biodiversity is important. Just with as we've seen in the past with avian influenza, we're starting to get concerns and people talking about you know, killing bats or getting rid of bats. And we really want to come with good, strong evidence about um, whether that's a good idea. I think innately most of us would feel that that's not a great idea because we do need to protect biodiversity and, and in ecosystems, but if you need that added evidence, remind um, your friends and colleagues that bats help to control pests, the insectivorous bats, Others are pollinators and they promote agriculture. And then many are seed dispersers. And in some of the, the places in the world where we really feel like uh, exposure and spillover risk of these new pathogens are um, most likely, um, those bats that are seed dispersers, the fruit bats, are connecting fragmented landscapes. As people move out into these landscapes and really break them into smaller and smaller pieces, it's the large seed dispersers that help keep the plants from going extinct so that they can move them. The other important thing is that um, bats are 
um, really uh, good at re responding to any kind of culling event. So like many other mammals, attempts to, um, to lethally control them have been generally unsuccessful and they encourage bats from other areas to come into communities, maybe bringing other things or more virus. It also encourages an increased recruitment or birth rate. Um, and that we know from our research is an increase for transmission potential because as the bats increase their reproductive rate, there are more susceptibles in the population and the virus is very good at finding the right point at which to be shed from its evolutionary host. So it's really when the, the dams start to wean the pups that we see a big increase in shedding and we just want to make sure that people don't accidentally increase their risk um, by culling bats. Um, we want the bats, but even those who might not want the bats, it's putting them at extra risk. So I just wanted to make sure you were armed with that evidence that you could share if you're starting to hear those concerns in your communities. All right, so at the One Health Institute, we have for a decade been running the PREDICT project. And the PREDICT project uh, has helped in 60 labs around the world to really strengthen the capacity to detect viruses like SARS coronavirus 2 um, right at the start of spillover events or even identify them early. So this is preferable. Communities are aware and ready for um, these viral spillover events. Now, unfortunately, we were not working in the area of China where we believe that this virus originally spilled over and started transmitting human to human. Um, so we hadn't seen this SARS coronavirus 2 in any of our studies or any other studies around the world. But again, we were aware that coronaviruses were a big risk. And our collaborators had identified in China the most closely related virus. It is, a, it's about 96% the same. In, um, in viral RNA connectedness, that's not that similar, but it does help us identify some of the potential risks that people are participating in um, that put them in contact and at exposure risk to these viruses. And in fact, our teams in China and Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries have been able to identify that it is that human food value chain that includes wildlife that is so risky um, in these regions especially. There are other risks as well, like guano harvesting, but we're really worried about that, that value chain. And of course, controlling the amount of wildlife and how they're handled in that value chain also helps the wildlife themselves. I think the most important thing we did, a lot of people point to us discovering about a thousand viruses and identifying known viruses that are bad actors and new hosts and new risk interfaces and new geographies. Those are all really good things, but really it showed us that we know we can do this. We can identify viruses early. And we created that workforce and trained almost 7,000 people to be able to really um, get out in the field safely to collect samples, not hurt the wildlife as we're doing that, not put ourselves at risk of exposure, get into the laboratories and understand um, how to detect and discover new virus. The ongoing obstacles with this um, terrible COVID situation is that we are going to continue to see um, people with really big stress responses. Um, we're going to likely have an epidemic now of depression and post-traumatic stress um, based on the isolation and the experiences that everyone's having. And those will be um, much more difficult according to certain um, disparities. For example, in some countries, um, women's isolation is considered to be more dangerous and more harmful than men. But in, in all over the world, we're seeing that men are actually more vulnerable to the health impacts that, that lead to death. So we're really seeing these disparities, and I believe it's in 85% of the countries that are reporting um, COVID deaths and disease by gender that we're seeing an increase in men being ill compared to women. 
The good news though, we have over uh, almost 199 vaccine candidates for COVID um, disease in the SARS coronavirus 2, and uh, 10 of those are already in clinical trials. Um, we also have dozens of uh, drugs, antivirals, that will be developed as part of this um, terrible tragedy, but will give us more tools in our toolbox in the future. So this is very wordy. I just wanted you to have access to sort of our blueprint for what needs to be done and what we believe will help us with this terrible tragedy, but also will get us out of um, having a disease X or another terrible pandemic in the future. We have all of the tools we need. Um, we need to apply them and we need political will to use that information um, to put in place prevention and control measures. But that is possible, especially if we use the One Health approach where we are being collaborative, looking across disciplinary lines and collaborating across international lines. This is not a political disease. It knows no party and it knows no border. And we need to recognize that and continue to work together. And I think the scientific community has done that very well. And we just need that to flow through to all of our communities at all levels. We're continuing to support through activities with the PREDICT project, testing more hosts in the countries surrounding China, trying to identify whether or not um, this virus is available for detection and characterization outside of humans. Um, we're also trying to strengthen that workforce and provide those experts that were trained in PREDICT. But as well, we're working with more than 100 faculties of veterinary medicine, nursing, medicine, pharmacy, public health around the world to develop their curricula through a project called the One Health Workforce Next Generation to try and make sure there is a workforce that is engaged in One Health and ready to prevent this problem in the future. We're also working through a project called the Global Virome Project, and I invite you all to join us at the website and um, really start to think about being part of a coalition that thinks about conservation and the animal species, but also about humans and preventing those spillover events that can lead to epidemics and pandemics. And with that, I will hand it back to our host. Thank you very much, Jana. Excellent presentation about COVID-19 and the ongoing efforts um, at the One Health Institute. So thank you again for that. And now we're going to kind of move focused in a little bit. We're going to move into a little bit about the OWCN's um, operations during a pandemic. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Sicardi, and he's going to talk about OWCN response during a pandemic. So all you, Mike, take it away. Great. Thank you. Deneen. And thank you to Jana for a great uh, starting presentation for us. Um, one of the things I do want to mention, she didn't mention it, but uh, we were proud of Jana because not only is she on the board, uh, but she is the founding director of the OWCN. So she does um, bring a host of experience in oil spill response, as well as her current role as a world leader in the COVID-19 uh, response measures. So um, as Deneen said, uh, I am going to be speaking a bit about the OWC and response. Should we need to respond during this time? Um, I do want to thank the entire Oil Wildlife Care Network management team for this presentation, uh, for the information here, because we've been working hard to develop our protocols and procedures related to COVID-19 response. Uh, in particular, Kurt and Kira for their leadership on both the field ops and the care ops teams to make sure that this information uh, comes out. So um, I am uh, fortunate enough to be able to pre be presenting the work of the entire team. And let's see. Okay. just as a reminder, our mission to provide best achievable capture and care to oil affected wildlife um, we currently have 45 network members, many of which are everybody that's on the uh, call today. I believe we've now gone over 125 participants. So thank you all for being here. 
Um, I do emphasize and continue to emphasize that the Oil Wildlife Care Network, the uh, Karen C. Dreher Wildlife Health Center has the responsibility and take very seriously as far as managing the network. But the network is all of us. It's all 45 organizations um, led from the top by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Office of Spill Prevention and Response. But it is the 45 organizations and the more than 1400 responders we currently have in our system. So it does take a village and we are that. Um, reminder, uh, our four areas, we call the four R's, readiness, research, reaching out. We're gonna be talking today specifically about our response actions and how the response actions have changed within this pandemic. First and foremost, as far as response, initial notification, there really hasn't been changes associated with notifications uh, during this pandemic. If there is an oil spill uh, in the California environment, either marine or inland, um, that information as my mouse decides to stop working, uh, that information, typically OSPR will receive that within their hotline and they contact us directly to determine whether or not OWCN activities need to happen. We can be contacted directly by a responsible party uh, as far as notification of a spill, but that activation actually does come directly through OSPR. However, as especially as those organizations are aware that get individual oiled animals on a regular basis, we can be notified through you, our member organizations, if individual animals show up either marine or inland side, we can then reverse the process to see if there has been an oil spill um, uh, that has been reported and determine whether or not activation is needed. And then the members of the public, we can actually have people calling our hotlines or the OSPR hotlines to uh, report either oiled animals or an oil spill in the environment. So as far as activation, typically activation for us, we're going to be deploying resources, we're gonna be activating facilities, and we're gonna be mobilizing responders should it be decided that activation needs to occur. Really, the OWCN continues to be available and operational for activation with some caveats, obviously, to keep people as safe as possible, but allow us to respond in a safe and humane way to animals in crisis. So safety truly is job one. We want to make sure that you as our responders are able to do the work um, that is necessary to de-oil and really provide best care possible to these animals, but ensure that you are not putting yourselves at increased significant risk for doing so. So in short, we are going to be following both the governor's uh, requirements and guidance, as well as the uh, guidance and recommendations from OSPR that we get directly from the department. But we are also going to be following the best scientific advice possible through the WHO, CDC experts, such as Jana and the other experts from the One Health Institute. What we're gonna be doing is applying all of that information to change our protocols and procedures to make sure as things progress within the pandemic, as we get more awareness of how to keep people safe, we're actually applying that to guidance documents and protocols as they evolve. So as far as mod modifications to activation, we're gonna be taking a risk benefit approach. And really what that means is each response is going to be evaluated based on both animal as well as human welfare. We're also gonna be looking at conservation value. We're gonna be looking at all the different elements as they relate to the benefit of a response and weighing that against the risks to individuals, both responders, um, other folks that may be involved to determine the level of response, the level of activation and whether or not activation can occur. At all levels though, we're gonna be minimizing our staffing footprint. We're gonna be changing the protocols and procedures to try to make sure that we're putting out the fewest in, uh, individuals possible to allow us to satisfy our mission. So we actually see our typical org chart here, the groups showing those that the OWCN directly manages on behalf of OSPR. What it's really going to look like is we may have modified 
organizational chart. We may be reducing the amount of groups. We may be reducing the ICS infrastructure to allow us again to conduct operations in a way that protects animals, but it also protects people. As far as responder selection, at this point, we're going to be using staff only, primarily either UC Davis staff, so the OWCN management team, or OSPR staff. Um, that way we're keeping our responders as safe as possible. However, if a response is too large to have individuals uh, either through UCD or Cal Fish and Wildlife respond, we will be calling on our member organizations. What we, we will be selecting individuals that have the highest level of training, knowledge, and experience. Um, they'll or be brought in as a staff responder. And we're actually going to be looking at people that can work independently uh, in a solo capacity. That way we have, we're decreasing our person-to-person um, -person contact, increasing um, physical distancing in those situations. Also, if responders are selected, we are allowing responders having the right to refuse. So we'll be providing information up front as far as what the response is, providing pre-deployment information and giving responders the ability to say yes or no before we send them in. Right from day one, we're going to be practicing active downsizing at every single level of the response to make sure at whatever point we can, we're decreasing the numbers of individuals that are out there, which allow us to um, satisfy our mission. So general safety practices, many of these are the things that we're practicing right now in our homes. And when we have limited uh, forays out into the environment, physical distancing, keeping the six feet between people, illness reporting, uh, making sure that people are not uh, playing the hero. If you are feeling ill for any reason, making sure people are reporting that on a daily basis. So supervisors will be asking daily questions of the folks that report to them. We may also be instituting taking daily temperatures of individuals, responders, to try to catch early infection should that occur. Uh, emphasizing sanitation, both from a personal level, as far as hand cleaning, behavioral adjustments, coughing and sneezing into the crook of the elbow, et cetera. Also regular clothing changes, changing before you go home, changing before you head back to the hotel, et cetera but also sanitation to the equipment, making sure that uh, equipment that's being used is uh, decontaminated regularly. That includes the steering wheels of vehicles, it includes nets, it includes pens, everything that may be touched by uh, humans or may have uh, some of the, the virus um, on them, we want to make sure that that's decontaminated appropriately. A PPE, a minimum of N95 masks being worn at all times, uh, when individuals are within proximity of each other or transiting through areas where people um, had walked previously, and also the wearing of either nitrile or latex gloves at all times. We're also emphasizing for dedicated items as far as equipment. And so it may very well be that nets or uh, radios, et cetera, are dedicated to certain teams and those stay with those teams throughout the response. Uh, if individuals have to be within the physical distancing parameters of six feet, we may be requiring face shields in addition to the N95 masks to keep people as safe as possible. Last but certainly not least is emphasizing personal care. Good rest, good levels of nutrition, making sure that everybody is taking care of themselves to be able to decrease the risks of acquiring disease. So some general field op safety, water-based, land-based, we are going to be uh, minimizing people in boats, either two people or three people for, per vessel. For land base, we are asking individuals to be in their own vehicles, or if they're large vehicles, keeping six feet apart, and minimizing stops within certain um, search parameters. And so not stopping at the gas stations on a regular basis, but maybe once every couple of days. Everybody providing their own food and drink. And as far as team sizes, if individuals are only doing a single operational activity, a minimum of two individuals, but if there are additional activities, if we're sending field ops teams that we're asking them to do recovery, as well as field stabilization, a minimum of three to be able 
to ensure that all of the duties are covered. As far as animal transfer, making sure everybody's using masks and gloves as well. What we're going to be doing is reducing the direct person-to-person uh, -person contact of animals being transferred. So we'll actually, instead of the picture here where somebody is handing uh, bird boxes directly to an individual, the transporter will leave that in a pre-designated space, back off, the receiver will go collect them, they'll wipe down the handles, and then the transporter will return to their vehicle and not drive away until the animal is taken. If chain of custody forms are required, the chain of custody forms will be signed and attached to the container in a Ziploc bag. Once the receiver receives it, they will take it out of the Ziploc bag and sign it, and the transporter will wait to see it sign signed before they then drive off. As far as care operations within facilities and general activities, we're gonna be minimizing personnel likely doing remote sign-in, sign-out through better impact, so not actually coming to a centralized location, but having people doing it on their smart devices. Within teams, within areas, we're gonna be having static teams. So individuals, instead of moving through a facility, will be assigned to a certain area and a certain team. We'll be limiting transit between areas, and we'll be taking staggered breaks to ensure not an increased number of individuals are in close contact at a single time and trying to emphasize the ability of people working individually when it's practical and safe. Again, as I said earlier, we'll be assigning equipment to areas or personnel and using prepackaged individual items as far as food instead of our typical catering. We'll also be implementing engineering solutions. So some engineering solutions that will be used in facilities is increased space. So we may be bringing in tents to increase the floor space of areas to allow increased physical distancing between areas. We'll be increasing the ventilation even beyond our 10 to 15 air exchanges per hour. We'll be increasing the number of exam tables, wash tables. We may be putting a barrier over the middle. This is my uh, attempt to show a barrier in between the wash area here. And we'll be duplicating shared areas. And so if there's like say a way station, normally in intake area, everybody congregates to a single scale. We'll be doing uh, multiple scales, at each of which will be at a different intake station. We imp implementing a one-way transit of flow through a facility, if at all possible. And as far as data collection, we'll be uh, trying to do some remote collection and communicating in a rad via ra radio or telephone to decrease the risk of scribes actually being in contact. So with that, I apologize having to go quickly on that, but hopefully it shows you some of the things that we're trying to implement during this really crazy time. At what it comes down to is we can provide best achievable capture and care for effective wildlife during pandemics such as this. And we can remain healthy and safe in doing so um, by practicing good um, procedures and uh, setting those things up. And as Jana indicated earlier, we will get through this together as a network. So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I really appreciate you presenting all of the behind the scenes planning that has been done um, by the team to, to think about how we can respond during these times. So moving um, to our next presentation, we actually have been, many of you may know that we have been called to action during this time. And um, our next presentation is gonna talk a little bit about the Kiyama River incident. And we're gonna have first um, Wendy Massey, who's our response specialist, talk a little bit about the field operations. And then we're gonna directly transition to Dr. Lorraine Barbosa, our facility veterinarian. And she is gonna talk about the care portion of this incident. So I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy. And um, thank you both for being here. And one last quick plug for, please continue to submit your questions via the chat. Wendy, it's all you. Hi, everything look okay? You look great. Okay. So Lorraine and I are gonna talk about our most recent spill response. Um, I was the recovery group supervisor for this response, and I only have about five minutes, so I'm just going to hit some key field operation points. Um, on, 
sorry, why isn't it forwarding? There we go. So on 4 a.m. on Saturday, March 21st, a tanker truck came around a bend of Highway 166 and it lost its trailer. And it rolled down the cliff and spilled approximately 6,000 gallons into the Kiwama River. Um, heavy rains were expected, which posed the risk of flash floods, which is not only an operational safety risk, but it would also further disperse the product. So they were pretty quick to put out some boom and also two miles downstream, they put up a temporary berm to try and contain the oil. Um, what was different about this spill is one thing was poor communications. There was poor radio coverage and no cell phone coverage. So Osper put out what's known as a cow. It's a cell on wheels unit and it helped, but it only helped in that immediate area. So most of the area, most of the operational area still had no service. Um, and at this point we knew that there were threatened and species of concerns in the area. This is an example of what our morning operational briefings looked like. Um, everybody was in 95 up, and this is one of the few times that everybody was clustered together. And you can't see there's a whole entire circle of people. And what we found out, you know, the, the guys in the middle that would talk to us um, had their masks on and nobody could hear them and see their mouth moving so nobody understood. So the guys in the middle would have to take their masks off. And the other thing that we realized is when you're wearing an N95 out in the field and it's hot, you can't understand each other and it's really difficult to wear when it's, it's warm outside. Um, one of the other things that we found was we had two, we only had one team and two miles of fairly technical river to get through. So where do you find this little guy in two miles of river? So we did, you know, we, we boned up on our, um, you know, species information and everything. And then we started to find certain things like the Western pond turtles, they liked really deep areas that were silty bottomed. They didn't like it when they were rocky. So we started looking for them and sure enough, we started finding even tiny little guys like this. And the problem for them was that those deep pockets in the river are also big collection points for oil. The red-legged frogs, which were federally threatened and we had never worked with before, um, so we tried to look up where they lived and everything. And we also listened to their vocalizations. And they have a really specific one syllable vocalization, which is really different for frogs, at least in my opinion. And what we found out is they lived in these dead wooded areas, you know, dead wood piles along the side or even overhanging the, um, the water. And so one of the things we found out that really helped is we got um, good LED flashlights and even on a bright sunny day, it really helped us go in and try and find them. And we did. And um, the other thing that I thought in my life, I have captured a lot of Western toads. So I thought I kind of had an idea where they hung out. You know, they hang out on the grass, on the embankments, in burrows, things like that. Well, where we, the first one we found was five foot up a sheer cliff rock face in this little crevice. You would have never thought that this chubby, chunky little frog could actually even climb up and get in there. It's really impressive. So after that, we wound up finding um, chorus frogs, so tree frogs. In this case, um, Baja California tree frogs that were up sheer cliffs. I mean, as high as, <laughs> as, high as Scott, which is like 6'6" in these tiny little crevices. And you ne I never would have thought to look for them there, but that's where they hung out. And anyways, I'm, I only have a few minutes, so I'm gonna hand it over to Lorraine, but we learned a lot. You know, I never have dealt with some of these species and just trying to navigate between the pandemic and just the river and also the river level. If it rained, it rose and fell. Um, up to like four feet. It was incredible.
So we've learned a lot. Take it away, Lorraine. All right, let's see here. Okay, does that look okay, everyone? All right, thanks. So I was just gonna give you a little bit of insight into some of the challenges of oil spill response during the pandemic at our primary care facility. Make sure this works. Okay, so first, uh, there were limited people to help. Uh, our primary care facility, which was Pacific Wildlife Care, so thank uh, you to the staff of Pacific Wildlife Care if you are on this uh, meeting now. Uh, you guys were already limited with uh, personnel fewer than normal coming to the center during this pandemic. Additionally, I remember when I called to activate the center or asked them if they could help with taking in oil spill animals uh, they already had a fairly high caseload, um, even a bit higher than normal during this time. And we're suspecting that perhaps with people sheltering in place, there are, they're going out and about a little bit more frequently and able to pick up animals. And uh, I've heard from other centers, it sounds like some of you guys are dealing with that as well. We made a modified site safety plan for this particular oil spill, uh, including requirements for respiratory, respiratory protection and physical distancing whenever possible. And another uh, change we made was that although a care and processing group supervisor, a response veterinarian, and other additional OWCN staff would typically be deployed to work at a primary care facility during a response. Uh, this time we elected not to send any OWCN staff down there just to uh, help with physical distancing requirements at the, at the facility. Um, so I was in uh, those roles and I ended up uh, overseeing animal care remotely. And some of the ways we facilitated this remote uh, animal care oversight was that uh, we had daily calls with a point person from Pacific Wildlife Care. So we started with having three calls a day when there were high numbers of animals coming in and then we uh, decreased those calls to twice and then finally once a day when there were no more animals coming in and we were just kind of dealing with uh, rehabilitation and management of those individuals. And that was super helpful just to keep the lines of communication open. We also used photos for diagnoses. So there were just a few clinical issues that came up in our spill patients. And it was really uh, helpful to have photos, though not, of course, ideal. Um, definitely second best to being there in person. But of course, the uh, staff and personnel at Pacific Wildlife Care is very knowledgeable. And they also have a veterinarian on on staff, on site. So that was, that was tremendously uh, useful for this spill and appreciated. Um, and another tool we used was remote record viewing. So I don't know if many of you might uh, have heard of WORMED or OWERMED. So WORMED is the Wildlife Rehabilitation Medical Database. It's a database for electronic medical records. And we have the developers of WORM have actually been working for some years to develop OWERMED for us. Um, so we got the oiled part in there. And this is the database. We actually used it for the first time during this spill um, for the spill. And so this was tremendously useful for this remote management. I was able to log in and see patient records. Um, Luckily, Pacific Wildlife Care is one of the centers that typically uses WORMED for their uh, patient records. So they made a remarkably seamless transition to using OWERM, which is fantastic uh, and super useful for this spill. Um, and then a couple of other things, Wendy mentioned a little bit about some of the patients that they collected. We actually had a huge variety of species collected for this spill. So as is more typical for an inland spill as opposed to a marine spill, we had, a, we had um, six different species come in with only 18 individuals collected. We still had that large variety of species coming in. And that presents some challenges just because with that variety of species, you're gonna have a lot of different care needs. And one of the things we came across was on day four, we got our first amphibian. And along with the collection of this frog uh, came the knowledge that there was chytrid in the population of frogs from the Kuama River uh, system. 
And if you guys know a little bit about chytrid, it's a devastating fungal disease that can wipe out populations of amphibians. So it's definitely um, something we don't want to risk introducing to a population where it's not our, already present. So we have this knowledge that there is chytrid in this system. And when thinking about transferring this animal to Pacific wildlife care, we realized we weren't sure of the chytrid status of amphibians in and around uh, their center. So we quickly made the decision to go ahead and activate our MASH, our Mobile Animal Stabilization Hospital, um, which was already luckily down near the spill site. And we ended up sending our amphibian patients there. Um, and our team was able to uh, intake and process and wash and release the amphibians straight from the MASH. So that was, that was very um, great that they were able to do that. So overall, I think uh, this spill went extremely well considering all the restrictions we had in place during this time and we learned a ton um, and I think we'll be even better prepared for the next spill, um, especially if it's during uh, this type of challenging time. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, Wendy, for for sharing a little bit about our recent response. Please continue to submit your questions. This is your last chance as we are moving into our final speaker before the chat. Um, questions will be entertained by Scott Puel. So I'd like to introduce um, hot off the press, our new field veterinarian. Um, Dwayne Tom joined us right as this pandemic was starting and um, I don't think he's actually worked a day in the office yet, but we've been connecting with him via Zoom. So I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne and let him share a little bit about himself. Dwayne? Yes. Can there everybody see my screen? Looks good. Hi everybody, my name is Dwayne Tom. I'm the new field stabilization veterinarian for OWCN. Uh, it's a privilege to be working with everybody here, um, member organizations and uh, the staff especially that have been so helpful during these times. Uh, I know I have uh, some pretty big shoes to fill um, of Nancy Anderson's because um, she, has, she has so much uh, knowledge and experience that she's had and um, she was actually uh, one of my um, instructors and mentors when I was uh, uh, in veterinary school and um, when I started my career in wildlife medicine. So um, I'm looking forward to the challenge, but I know it's gonna be, it's gonna be some pretty big shoes to fill. So um, I was born and raised in, in Hawaii and I attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Initially, I got a, a degree in Bachelor um, of Business Administration in Management Information Systems and Finance. And then after working in the field for a few years, uh, you know, I, I, veterinary school has always been a goal of mine. And so I went back to school and I uh, finished my pre-vet core uh, before attending uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, College of Veterinary Medicine over in Columbus. Uh, go Bucks! After um, by um, getting my degree in veterinary medicine, I moved on to Los Angeles, where I did an internship at the Animal Surgical and Emergency Center in Santa Monica. And following that, uh, I was working in a general practice and doing emergency until I was able to get a job at the California Wildlife Center in um, Calabasas. At CWC, I was there for approximately 12 years where I gained a lot of uh, experience working with terrestrial and aquatic birds, uh, terrestrial mammals and reptiles, as well as uh, marine mammals, uh, California sea lions and elephant peel pups. So that, that's where um, a lot of my background is. It's within uh, the clinical aspects of wildlife rehabilitation. Following my time at CWC, I uh, relocated up to Oregon for a few months where I did some volunteering and consulting with uh, a few non, uh, uh, nonprofit organization rehab facility, uh, facilities up in there in, uh, in Oregon. Uh, and I was able to uh, 
get some time with a lot of new species that I had never uh, had the opportunity to work with before. And so, it, you know, it's something that I was looking forward to uh, gaining more knowledge and uh, kind of uh, broadening my, uh, my knowledge base of different species. Uh, I also spent time in, I went back to Hawaii and I also spent time in Belize uh, volunteering and working uh, with some um, rehab facilities there. Um, on the left, that's a, a golden eagle from up in um, Astoria. And on the right, that's a collared arasari uh, that we worked on in uh, Belize. So particularly in Belize, uh, there was a lot of uh, challenges because there wasn't um, the type of facilities and supplies and medical equipment that um, I was used to uh, here in the States. And so there's a lot of things that I, uh, I had to adapt with um, just with what they had there in terms of uh, you know, getting a lot of the medical supplies from uh, hardware, hardware stores and things like that and uh, figuring out ways to, uh, to adapt to, you know, to do with what, what they had available. Um, on the left, that's a spectacled owl, and on the right, that's a, a harpy eagle that I worked with at, at the Belize Zoo. And I, I continue to um, to do consulting services. It helps to keep my um, my medical, my clinical aspects um, uh, up to date. And so I, I try to help out and try to uh, do consulting for uh, some of the facilities that I volunteered up in Oregon. Uh, back in Hawaii and in, in Belize, as well as uh, in California. Uh, I do some consulting for some of the organizations there and um, also in, a, in a, uh, another facility up on, on the East Coast. But, uh, <clears throat> and I look forward to meeting all of you uh, at some point in time. And if you have any questions or you want to reach out to me, that's my UC Davis email at OWCN. And um, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dwayne. We look forward to, to seeing you in person too. So thank you for that. And um, again, welcome. And now I'm going to turn it over to our responder specialist, Scott Buell. I think all or many of you know him and he is going to go through some of the questions that were submitted. Um, I recognize that we're going a little bit behind. So if people need to leave, um, thank you for being here. And we really appreciate your time today. But Scott, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, and thanks everyone for coming here uh, and connecting virtually. Uh, we were kind of this kind of our first test run, and we're really excited to see that we we capped out about 132 people. So that's great. Um, so quickly, I just want to address a few questions that did come in through the chat. So thank you all who submitted those. So the first question that came in um, from Susan, and Susan was asking, um, kind of in uh, regards, I think, to Mike's presentation. Um, if in the event of a large, highly accessible area for a spill, which draws convergent balls, uh, such as Costco Busan, you know, what exactly would the plan be in that situation? So I believe Greg McGowan actually uh, answered that a little bit via chat. So maybe Greg, could you start with just uh, elaborating what you, on what you said and then I'll let Mike chime in. There we go. I can't there myself, thank you. Um, so just really fast, uh, uh, Scott, if you want to let me know who you want to speak, then I need to unmute them as the host. Ah, sorry right, about Greg. that. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so just uh, all I put in there is, I think we would, like we're already seeing uh, there's some engagement of law enforcement to just control the public right now, going to the beach and combining and hanging out together. We would pretty aggressively en engage local and state police, as well as uh, the department's law enforcement to tr help try and control in, a, in an area as big as San Francisco Bay, that would be difficult, but um, that would be uh, one step. The second is we would establish a volunteer program um, and try and engage volunteers. So come and work through us rather than independently deploying yourself out to the beach and grabbing oil pelicans or something. And uh, lastly, we would use the public information office to really push messaging out there that if you're going out and de self-deploying to collect wildlife, you're, you're very much like more likely to do more harm than good. Um, you're much better off to call the hotline, report the oil wildlife and get it in the system where we can get things done with professionals uh, quickly and efficiently. Perfect. 
Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. And maybe Mike, could you speak to, I know during the presentation, we talked a lot about doing staff only, kind of our primary uh, role right now, but if there was a large spill that really did push us to consider a volunteer response. Yeah. Um, as, as, as I said, we're going to try to emphasize staff, if at all possible, and staff level positions. If we do have a situation where we have a massive response and it's decided that volunteers are needed at certain levels, um, we will have the ability to call people in, but they will be selected based on experience, knowledge, and we will be trying to minimize it if at all possible. So there is the possibility, but again, it's going to be fairly far down in the process instead of being as inclusive as we normally are to bring lots of people in. We're going to be taking a true, real, uh, critical look at how many individuals are absolutely necessary to provide us the most humane care possible. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, and fingers crossed that we don't have to uh, test that out. Uh, okay. <laughs> so next question I saw on the chat from Colleen, who was asking how much PPE, such as N95 masks or face shields, does OWC and have stockpiled considering limited ability to order um, more during this pandemic? So I actually wanted to see maybe, um, uh, Matt, does Kurt, Kurt and Kira, they're able to speak, correct? Yes. All right, Kurt and Kira, maybe starting with Kira, could you start with the field side and then maybe Kurt, could you chime in on the care side about just some of our general supply status? Sure, yeah, so um, on the field side right now, we have plenty of PP stock for, for our purposes. Uh, obviously, that's, that stock is gonna be, um, is gonna be jeopardized if the, the COVID guidelines continue for a long period of time. But for now, we have made it a point to, to keep what we need so that we would be able to protect uh, the staff that we deploy in the event of an oil spill. So at this point on the field side, we're, we're doing pretty well. Kurt? Great. I guess I'm not quite as optimistic or maybe not quite as well prepared as Kira is. I guess it's probably the latter. I'm probably not as well prepared or we're not as well prepared. Um, we've been doing, as Mike was talking about and as Mike presented, we've been doing some, um, some real serious um, thinking about what what it would mean in terms of the center um, operations, the primary care facility operations. And while we have enough um, currently on hand to, um, to get us started, one of the things we are doing um, now is really looking at um, what do we need to have on hand to be able to um, guarantee that. Obviously, with the, um, with the N95 masks in particular, that's not something that we have typically utilized for everyone in the facility. And so the, um, the amount that we would go through on a given day has jumped significantly, even if we have a um, limited number of, of people. And as Mike was talking about, really limiting the number of people would be one way that we have to deal with the, um, the PPE so that we're able to um, not run through it nearly as fast by giving it to individuals and, and allowing them to utilize it as long as it's working, obviously still having to change out um, whether it's a daily basis or every other day basis. Um, but we're working on trying to really come up with more realistic numbers and, um, and try and at least get those orders into the pipeline. All of that being said, uh, what I would say is uh, in comparison to a lot of other sectors of the public, we're in so much better shape as far as PPE. In fact, we had enough PPE that early in the pandemic response when hospitals were running low, especially on Tyvek and gloves, we were able to divert some of our stock that's based here in Davis to UCD Medical Center to be able to assist on the human response side. So as far as some of our standard PPE, we're definitely in good shape. Um, as far as some of the masks and uh, some of those other things, yes, we, we, we have enough face shields. Uh, N95 masks, you know, are limited all over, but we would be looking at, you know, also looking at alternative mask uh, techniques for individuals that are at much lower risks. Um, but uh, we're actually in, I think, I'm, I'm more optimistic 
Stickland and Kurt is, um, as far as the situation we're in, as far as readiness for a moderate size response. Everyone's always more optimistic than I am. I'm the yeah, well. uh, doomsayer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Denise, did you have any comments from the readiness side? Sure. Um, just also to add, in addition to what CARE and FIELD has in their individual um, stockpiles, we also have a back stock that's kind of um, our readiness back stock or shared back stock that they can pull from. Um, so that, that was recently, pre-pandemic, that was um, re-inventoried and brought up to our minimum number that we have decided that we need it. So we're pretty good in that, in that place as well. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. That's a good, good, solid response. And then just to, I'm throwing one additional piece too. As I know, just recently we all saw it hit our inbox, but I think some of the PPE sources are coming back online as available. I think we saw something come through our safety officer at the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis that actually mentioned that they were finding uh, some available N95s that you could purchase um, as of like yesterday. So that's good news. Uh, so hopefully the back stocks um, are growing again. Um, okay, one other uh, quick question I wanted to ask. This one's going to go to Wendy. Uh, we had a question from David that said, why were species that were, uh, that were more outside of the river, like six feet above, of concern or collected during the response? Okay. Um, just like the toad I talked about, um, he was up a rock face, but at the bottom of the rock was a pool of oil was the river. So he had nowhere else to go but down. Um, most of these places were um, right next to the water, just up above. And also remember that oiled animals move. So a lot of times we will go way outside the water to look for animals that are affected. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's it's a good question. And it's hard, to, it's hard to visualize, I think, when you're not there. But as I was lucky enough to be one of the people tromping along that river bed, uh, it, it makes sense that we, we definitely found some some uh, animals in odd places that definitely would be affected by the spill, so. Hey, Scott, All right. can, I add, can I add something? Absolutely. So one of the challenges we've had with amphibians and spills is that it's really hard to tell if they're oiled uh, just from looking at them from afar. So sometimes you have to actually have them in hand to examine them a little bit more closely. Right, right. So birds, a lot of times, things like birds, we can look through binoculars, we can see if they're oiled or not. But a lot of times with amphibians in particular, you do have to, you know, if you think they're threatened in some way, like that toad, he was, his pool of water that he had access to was covered with oil. So there was a real good chance, right? So you'd have to take him in hand and physically examine him. Yep. Um... Okay, I, I know we're now about four minutes over, so maybe I'll do one, one final question. Does that sound good, Deneen? Okay, so one final question I've got Richard. Richard Grice, we gotta get Richard in here. I know you got a good question here. So your question is saying, what's the plan for training, retaining volunteers and staff if we are off uh, for a long time? Um, obviously, we always have challenges trying to get folks involved and stay, stay involved and, and engaged with us. Um, so I think in general, I, I mean, it's a tough answer. I, I think I'll, I'll be happy to answer that question in the sense that um, I've been working with uh, Deneen and the readiness stream and really the whole team as a whole, looking at the uh, training program, our OWC training program, and trying to think about how to adapt it in these times. Um, and as you guys have seen, I, I think you, I've put a few updates up on the database that we're about to um, share our new revised training calendar. And just like everyone else, we're going to need to make some amendments. And so the goal is that we're going to try to stay connected. So today's event is one example. Uh, we're going to be considering doing a virtual uh, full deployment drill. So a drill uh, format that is going to be in a virtual virtual way. Um, we have quite a few new things we're going to try. We, we've talked about potentially and likely the summit that we have later this fall will be virtual. We could do it via Zoom instead of meeting in person. So certain um, training elements are actually nicely, uh, nicely translate to a virtual format. Other ones are harder. And so hands-on training and the in-person that you get from that, I mean, we've worked very hard to establish an in-person training program that regularly connects with people and we get to meet you guys in person and work with you side by side. And that's a really key aspect. And so that's something that we're continuing to work, to work on. And I think we have a good plan. So you'll see some new, more information coming out soon regarding that, but I think we have a good plan moving forward. Um, likely shifting any in-person trainings for OWCN will be no earlier than this fall. And they will come with some, some alterations of how we conduct things. We'll be having a lot 
uh, fewer participants per class. We'll be having additional safeguards in to maintain social distancing, wearing masks, PPE, et cetera. Um, so you'll see lots of things come out in the, sh in the near future kind of explaining those, those changes. But our hope is that we can get through this year with those types of amendments and still maintain engagement and involvement from everybody. And then hopefully, it, you know, things will slowly um, proceed over the next year or two and uh, we'll resume a little bit more normalcy over time. Um, and, but as, as of now, I think we'll be able to get through it with those, those changes. Anyone on, from the ODBC management team want to add to that? I think that was a great summary, Scott. Thank you. And with that, I know that there were a few other questions that were submitted and we will um, make sure that we read through the entire chat and make sure that we pick up any questions that we may have not been able to, to address today. We thank you all um, for submitting questions. I'd like to thank on behalf of the OWCN management team, I'd like to thank all the speakers today. Um, thank you to Jana for coming and, and speaking with us as well. Thank you to all of you for taking your time to join us. We really appreciate this. Um, this is our first virtual event, so we're very thankful for all of you. Continue to stay safe, be well, and we look forward to seeing you all soon, whether it's virtually or in person, depending on how um, things continue to, to, to evolve with this pandemic. So thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Thank thanks you to Deneen and Scott all. for organizing this. Uh, it was a lot of work, so great, great job, Deneen and Scott. Thank you, and also thank you to Matt Blake. Um, he's behind the scenes. He has been our Zoom master today, so big thank you to Matt Blake as well.